Whether it's bad planning, bad luck, bad timing, or bad inventions, well-intentioned bad decisions have plagued history for thousands of years. Welcome to Historic Hindsight. Hello and welcome to another episode of Historic Hindsight. I'm John, that's Tom, and today we're going to talk to you about Mardi Gras! Or not at all, Johnny, but I know you're excited for Mardi Gras. You got your beads on. I mean, you said you uh, said New Orleans, right? Yeah, we're, the battle. New Orleans? The, the battle of New Orleans, Johnny. Which uh, is which what Mardi Gras celebrates? In, yeah, no one know. It, um, it happens in 1815. Uh, you know, a little before, although I did, I knew you were going to go with that. So I did look up and I found <laughs> the first celebration of Mardi Gras does happen in New Orleans in like the 1730s. Although what we oh, know, I didn't know it had been around that long. That's crazy. Yeah, but what we know of Mardi Gras with like the parades and the boobies, that was more like the mid 1800s, and really not until you know the 80s where we get the boob boobs. Yeah, I I mean I don't even know what Mardi Gras actually celebrates. I I Fat Tuesday, I think. It, is that a like the religious holiday? I, before Good Friday I, I, or do whatever. Not, uh, do not put me on the spot. And, right, anyway, think, that's not well, what we're I think what it is. I think it's like the last day that you can get drunk and have fun during the whole Lent thing. Yeah, okay. But I don't know if that's exactly what it is or not. But I'm gonna go ahead and say that's what it is, and that you sounds, can correct me at home if you want. That sounds right. We'll go with it. But what we're actually here to talk about is an equally fun, depending on who you are, uh, a topic, which is the Battle of Nolens which happened on January 8th, 1815. Okay, so I'm gonna give us a little backstory. We're gonna jump right in here. And if you can see these damn flies, I apologize for that shit. I've been trying to kill them. I can't get them. They're everywhere. I don't know. Apparently it's breeding season for flies in Indiana right now. They're yeah, just... they're gonna be all over the place. So it is actually fought after the Treaty of Ghent is signed. And the Treaty of Ghent is what ends the War of 1812. But apparently word hadn't quite reached Nolans yet that we weren't fighting anymore. So, so this is one of those battles that everything's been decided and two uh, groups of people are just going to go ahead and have it out anyway without yeah. knowing. Yeah. That's great. Pretty much. It would be fought between the British Army under Major General Sir Edward Packenham. Uh, can you guess his occupation, Johnny? We're going to go back to that fun uh, I'm going to guess career military. There you go, career military. You really can't go wrong at this early. If you're a soldier this early as a general, it's, you're, you're usually a politician or a soldier. But he is career military and a politician. He is also joined with, with, with his Hichichi native allies because, you know, whenever there's a good old-fashioned war brewing in the, uh, in the colonies at this time frame, we like to bring in the natives on both sides i mean yeah you might as well there are they're already warring with each other so you find the one that is nearby that's warring with the one that's nearby to your enemy and you're like hey we'll help you kill the, these other indians and we'll you know right. you help us kill these white folk there you go it would be fought against the freshly new united states army under brevet major general andrew jackson johnny you should know that name Andrew. i do jackson. i recognize that he's on money yeah yeah, he is on money. <laughs> Can you guess his occupation, Johnny? I gave you a big hint already, but uh, a career military. I assume. There you go. Well, and politician. Sort of. He's he's a politician, lawyer, judge, and military. AKA this guy is the cream of the crop, prestige asshole. Uh, yeah. He likes to claim he fights for the little man, but has no idea who the little man even is. So I mean, that sounds familiar. Hey, right? Andrew Jackson, everybody. He is also joined with some Choctaw Native Americans uh, and a bunch of privateers, Johnny. And by privateers, I mean straight up pirates. <laughs> That's awesome. The army that he is commanding in, in, in this battle is 100% everything that you would think of as the melting pot in the United States. He has militia from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Mississippi. He has got Choctaw Indians. He has got a regiment of free people of color that are actually commanded by people of color. So this is really pretty progressive in comparison to what That's, we were like. Because yeah, even that, in the Civil War, we have to have Matthew Broderick command our, uh, our troops, you know, our black yeah, troops. And, so th and this command. is 1815? Yeah, we can't, have, we can't have black people leading black people. Yeah, this is 1815. Uh, he has French and Spanish Creole of New Orleans militia. And like I said, he's got pirates commanded by Jean Lafitte, although Jean Lafitte 
wouldn't actually be at this battle because he was a little bit too busy raping and pillaging on the seven seas, so to speak. But his brother, Pierre Lafitte, would be on the ground. And it was really their cannons that supplemented the regular army's artillery that really helped the Americans in this, in this upcoming battle. Nothing like a good cannon fire to help uh, swing things your way. Right? So what led up to the Battle of New Orleans? So first we have just a very brief overview of the War of 1812, because I guarantee you, you didn't really learn about it in, in, in history class. I think the only thing I learned about it was it was called the War of 1812, but either none of it or very little of it took part in 1812, and it lasted way you're, longer. Or yeah, you're, you're, pretty much, you're pretty much right. So essentially what happens is you have the French Revolution going on, and the Napoleonic Wars going on, and England blockades France, who's our biggest uh, trade partner, and we get a little pissed about that. So we say, you can't do that. You get, we still got to be allowed to trade with France. They're a trade partner. We want and our England stuff. Goes, uh-uh. <laughs> and so we keep trying to trade with France, and they keep taking our boats and impressing our soldiers into their naval. So, like, they are stealing our boats, stealing our people, and forcing them to fight for the British. So we're like, you can't. That, like, come on. can't do this. Yeah. So we fight a war over it. So is this why we started making rules for war? Because the people started fighting unfairly? Like, like uh, I understand rules that war, we're killing yeah. each other and everything, but we have to be civil oh, they've, about this. They've always been there, Johnny. It's just the degree of who wants to abide by them or not. I mean, that's really what it boils <laughs> down to. So as far back as August 1814, Britain and the United States have already acknowledged that they're pretty much in a stalemate, have already acknowledged that both sides have gained what they really wanted, and have decided to start negotiating peace. As far back as August 1814, they're like, this is like not benefiting either of us. Why don't we have a, why don't we have a truce? Yeah. yeah right. Peace treaty. We'll call it, we'll call it a wash. And that's the one thing that we also not, because I always, we never lost the war, right, Johnny? Yeah, that's right. 1812 was actually a draw. Like the war of 1812, it, there was no winner. There was no loser. It was legitimately a draw. You can't, well, hey. other than the fact that we're still standing, I guess you can't, say we won we're like what 12 0 and 1 or something then like that's still undefeated <laughs> yeah right it's still undefeated i guess yeah um both both sides would send their their representatives to the city of ghent in the united netherlands which is now belgium and peace would be signed on december 24th 188 or 18 15, 14 sorry excuse me got my names and dates wrong which pretty much sounds like they had a three-month party in belgium like they were just having having at it for three months in belgium while they country. negotiate peace. Yeah, good good beer from the monks there. Why not? On October 24th, 1814, British Secretary of State for War and of the Colonies, uh, Henry Bathurst, told Major General Edward Packham, listen, I know, you, I, know you, I know you've heard that there's peace talks. I know you think we're close to peace, but, but go ahead and ignore that. Because what I want to do is I want to go ahead and seize as much territory as we can before peace is signed, because that's what we do. We're the Brits, right? Yeah. yeah so he exactly. sends uh, you know, Major General Packham, who's actually right now in Jamaica with all of his fleet, and says, go ahead and start the, the New Orleans campaign or the, or the Louisiana campaign, where we want you to go ahead and take as much territory in Louisiana as you can. So he comes up with the idea, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to – Take New Orleans, and the easiest way to do that is to, well, we can't really go through the Mississippi because the United States has it blockaded very, very well, and we have a lot of good forts up there, so it would be suicide to go over there. You can't really go overland to attack New Orleans and still have an element of surprise. I mean, you'd have to basically land at Baton Rouge and then cross all the way inland to Louisiana, and we don't want to do that. And it's a huge fucking swamp. And it's a huge <laughs> like, You don't want to cross all that. Up, yeah. And so they decide in the middle of winter that they're going to go and they're going to they're going to landfall at Nolens through uh, Lake Bjorn or Bjorn Bjorn. I don't know. These are Louisiana French names. I can't speak the way it is, anyways. <laughs> With the idea that we're going to seize New Orleans before peace is officially signed, so that way the Brits can now control Louisiana, which really would have halted U.S. westward expansion. And would have put a whole kibosh in Andrew Jackson's plans when he becomes president. Yeah. The whole manifest destiny, let's get rid of the Indians thing. Yeah, that would have put a few wrinkles in our uh, whole nation's fabric. Right? So Andrew Jackson is in 
Nolans, he is aware that there is a plan for the British to, uh, you know, try to get into the Louisiana. So at this point, he, uh, he decides that I'm going to build my army and go ahead and declare martial law in New Orleans to assist with, uh, with me being able to be a military occupant of said city. At which point the local judge says, you, you can't do that. You're not the president. You're not the governor. You have no legal authority to declare martial law in New Orleans. Wait, but did he, did he say please or? No, like... what he does do is he gets a couple of his soldiers and arrests the judge and throws him in jail and says, while I'm here, <laughs> it's, stop me. So basically he's an army. Basically he said, hey, judge, I'm not sure you understand what martial law means. Marshals? <laughs> go and go show him the law and then then just did it anyway that's fantastic <laughs> so we're gonna jump forward a little bit to the actual invasion here so like i said the only logical route is through lake bjorn borgna bjorgna is it b-j-o it's b-o-r-g-n-e borgna yeah whatever uh, British forces would, would arrive at the lake on December 14th, and they would fight the few U.S. gunboats that were there that blocked the entry and push them aside pretty quick because yeah, our Navy's not the strongest at this point. I mean, we are literally relying on pirates. Right. What's a, what's a gum boat? Real quick? It's, it's, not, it's, like, it's not a ship of the line. Like, the British are coming at us with big ships of the line. So, you know, think of right. the way you would effects. recognize. Yeah. And we got, like, a gunboat with, like, 20 guns on it. Gun. Okay, small gunboat. I thought I thought you said gum boat, and I thought it was oh, some no, gun, weird gun. Narlands thing. Gun. G U N. Gunboat. Okay. Uh, they would wind up landing their forces first at the uh, at the P Island, which uh, <laughs> P Island. It has since been changed to Pearl Island because. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> stupid fucking name. Uh, by December 23rd, British forces have slogged through the swamps and, uh, and lost a lot of their men through hypothermia because it is the winter. Even though you're in New Orleans, it's still the winter. You're in swamp wetlands, and it's freezing cold, and you've got troops that are more accustomed to Jamaica. Right, yeah. So well, and I think, I think the big part of it... Winter clothing. Yeah, I think the big part of it would be once you get clothes wet in the winter, like, what are you going to do? to dry? You're not going to dry them in new orleans air <laughs> like, they're just gonna not new orleans air, yeah, freeze no. and be cold and but they would make it by the 23rd they would make it to villiers plantation which is nine miles south of new orleans uh major gabriel villiers would actually escape through his bedroom window and run to new orleans to warn jackson when jackson so people actually it, did escape through bedroom windows and sneak out bedroom windows and right? stuff i always That's thought it was just some weird like make-believe tv trope that people did but apparently not nope. he's on his plantation he sneaks out runs over to andrew jackson says the british are coming <laughs> <laughs> he was the original <laughs> well i think that was supposed to be no, uh that's backwards yeah because that was that or whatever it was he well, also didn't actually do that either but that's not that's another that's yeah. another episode yeah we need to give israel bissell his due we do need to give some israel bissell due uh Andrew Jackson famously said when he heard the British were there, by the eternal, they shall not sleep on our soil, Johnny. They will not sleep one night on our soil. Although they've actually already slept on Pearl Island. So, I mean. I, I mean, I, it was their sand. Like, he didn't want to make his way far enough inland to the soil part of it. Right. I think on the evening of 23rd, Jackson led a daring three-pronged assault on the unsuspected British forces who, long story short, the British win a technical victory because they're not pushed from the land. So way to go, Jackson. So they're they just kind of... sleeping on the ground. No, I mean, it wasn't... It was kind of a draw battle. I mean, they did kick the shit out of the British quite a bit. There was a lot of losses the British to take. But, I mean, ultimately, Jackson didn't push the British from, you know... Right. So they, it's like... It's like if some bully came and stole your lunch table and your friends are like, hey, you need to go get that lunch table back. And you go up to him and you punch the bully once in the chest and then walk away. Like, you didn't do anything. You still so got you your table. You won. Like, you fought him. But, yeah, you still got, got what you want. But what it did do is it did show the British that, eh, this isn't going to be a walk in the park. We're not going to be able just to literally walk into Nolens and show our boobies and get some free beer and Mardi Gras. Like, it's not going to be that, that simple. Now, 
After failing to push the British forces off the land, Jackson would then go and set up defensive positions at what's called Rodriguez Canal. So there's a canal that's, that's just south, basically, of Nolens. He sets up defensive positions there, and what I mean is he actually extends the canal and makes it into a moat and then builds earthworks behind that. So you've got a very good fortified position. Like, you have to cross a moat, climb an earthwork hill, and then get to your troops. So he like he created it, like he had his men. Well, the canal was already there. He just extended the canal. Right, but they dug the it. Yeah, like the, yeah. you, to extend a canal, you have to dig. And by right? men, I mean slaves. Like yeah, they. Well, I mean yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, they, that's, <laughs> Don't be that's, ridiculous. <laughs> it's not. It's not like his soldiers were gonna do anything. That'd be insane. Uh, over the next week, the uh, the British forces would probe for weaknesses in defense, you know, in those those defenses, and uh, and look for alternative invasion routes. Almost every single officer went to Peckham and said, "Look, uh, yeah, let's call this shit off. Like their positions are pretty good. Like maybe we should figure out a different way in New Orleans. Or this, just, is, this is a losing situation over here. Or just say screw it. it. Like this is going to be a losing situation." Uh, Peckenham says uh, he falls in the old trap, Johnny. He falls in the trap of these are peasants and the enemy is here, so by golly, I'm going to fight them here. Yeah, they're in defensive positions. Like, don't, don't. Yeah, that's <laughs> maybe, maybe not like, next time. To explain how dumb this is for the British, those defensive positions that are fortified have a lot of artillery. And of the artillery, they have one 32-pound cannon, three 24-pound cannons, one 18-pound cannon, three 12-pound cannons, three 6-pound cannons, 150-millimeter howitzer. And if that wasn't enough, Johnny, across the west bank of the Mississippi River, Andrew Jackson would place two 24-pound guns and two 12-pound guns. These that would be able cannons, to bring hellfire on the approach as well. These cannons must be tiny. Oh, no, no, no. Those are the, that, that's the size of the projectile that they're shooting, Johnny. So a 32-pound cannonball is what's coming out of that bad boy. And every single one of these cannons is behind an earthwork fortification. So they're able to fire upon you without really any risks to them. Like, right, yeah. Comfortable. Because basically, so I assume they have like a little hole that they'll push a cannon out into, fire it, pull it back, load it up, and do it again. Yep, yep, yep. And so they're just never exposed. <laughs> Pretty much. Now, General Pakenham, he's not a complete idiot. And he does wait for his full force of 8,000 troops to arrive on the 7th. And I can't stress this enough, Johnny. This will come important very quickly when the battle begins. His troops aren't irregulars. They are all regular troops. They are all veterans of multiple campaigns. These guys know how to fight and know how to listen to orders. So if they're told to go forward, they'll go forward into hellfire. If they're told to retreat, they'll retreat. If they're they're well-trained dogs. Yeah, they're well-trained dogs. They have, they do not think for themselves. They are whatever their commanding right. officer says. That is what they're gonna do. So, mili- I mean, and, really, the military's dream recruits. Exactly. Cannot stress this enough. Uh, Peckenham's plan would be that he's going to take a troop, uh, about 780 guys, have them cross the, you know, the, the Mississippi onto the West Bank. Take those guns that are on the West Bank, turn them on the Americans' flank, and provide enfilade fire onto the defensive positions while the rest of the British troops do a frontal attack. Not a bad plan. But in order to pull this off, you got to have men in boats. And right now you're inland. So they start digging their own canal that leads to the Mississippi River. So you could just float your guys down that canal, sure. get to the river, cross the river real quick, and then march your troops up. The problem is the night that these troops are supposed to start marching, their damn canal collapses, and they now have to carry said boats overland through mud and muck. Oh, God. Yeah. But at, le- at least it's not like soft mud that collapses and is saturated with water, right? Yeah, right? It's not, <laughs> e- it's easy not trekking swamp. through that. <laughs> they already start off 12 hours behind because they've got to take these 42 small boats and drag them overland. When they finally do get underway, they also miscalculate the speed of the Mississippi, especially in the winter <laughs> when the water's a bit high. And they yeah. actually wind up landing two miles south of what their intended landing spot was. Uh, don't you hate it when well, you miss your exit? 
Yeah, so you missed That's your exit. Worst. You got to go two miles. So first thing in the morning at 5 o'clock a.m. on the 8th, the British main assault line is to, to begin its march forward, at which point the commanding officers go up to Peckenham and say, uh, we don't hear any gunshots or fire or battle coming from the West Bank, so maybe we want to delay just a scotch, at least at least till we you know, know what's going on over there. Right. Yeah. Well, it's like they didn't think maybe there's a chance something didn't go quite right and they're delayed. Right. Like they didn't, that didn't cross their mind. It's just, well, wow, we're supposed to go at 5 a.m. So that's what we're going to do. Yeah, d- d- and that's exactly it, Johnny. 5 a.m. The hell with it. March forward, men. Screw the whole damn boats. We don't need them. We don't need those extra guns. We'll just we'll just march straight at them. And Which the plan here is he's, they're aware of the moat. They're yeah. aware of the earthworks. They're supposed to have a regiment uh, that brings up ladders and footbridges to cross said moat and to get over the barricade so that they could easily do a frontal assault, right? That fell to Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Mullins of the 44th Regiment of Foot. And he forgot. Like, that regiment didn't have the ladders. <laughs> they didn't bring them up with them. They, they forgot them. But again, instead of just saying pause for a second let's go back and get them it's <laughs> keep, yeah. keep, keep going forward like, god i always do this i always screw up some mundane detail <laughs> instantly the british lines come under heavy artillery fire and i cannot stress this heavy artillery fire so the cannons at this point they're doing uh, two major types of, of ammunition that they're using they'll start off with grape shot which is typically a naval cartridge which is uh, larger round balls but usually between like nine and twelve of them and it's kind of like a shotgun. When it goes off, they spread out farther. Oh, but, so they're packing a bunch into one cannon. Yeah, you've got gotcha. about 12 okay. shots per gun, depending on the size okay. of the gun and all that kind of stuff. And the shells are about, you know, between an inch and two inches in diameter, depending, again, depending on the size of the cannon, depends on how big the grape shot is. So normally, like a Clementine. Yeah, normally you use the grape shot to, like, punch holes in sails or to rake the decks and get rid of the, uh, the soldiers on the decks. Right. It's a great anti-personnel cartridge. Yeah, it's like birdshot, but big so it'd be like bird know, shot if uh we had bird shot when the dinosaurs were around the yeah yeah it's, it's, yeah it's it'd dinosaur be for that bird type of bird <laughs> yeah and this is good out to about 200 200 plus yards so right oh, off God. the bat when the british start marching they're coming under fire with grape shots from these cannons when they get within 100 yards they turn this into what's called canister and canister is essentially 75 to 150 musket balls depending again on the size of the cannon that operate as a shotgun holy shit when they get within 50 yards that goes to double canister which means now you've got between 150 and 300 rounds at one time coming out of one gun so if you are a marched formation coming at these guns yeah uh it's it's like shooting fish in a barrel i mean and it's and I know it's not shrapnel, and it probably hurts way worse, but it's like just tons of shrapnel coming up at you out of Claymore or something. You know, it's just yep. – it's going to just obliterate three, Anything four people and then a couple people behind them, and then maybe a couple people catch something in the shoulder or arm or leg or whatever. That's nuts. Instantly, most of these officers get killed right off the bat just from pure dumb luck. I mean yeah. – it is what it is. Well, I mean, yeah, you're just, yeah, you're just firing at an area. And so now these highly trained soldiers don't know what to do because they're not being told what to do and they don't have <laughs> the means to think for themselves because they were told never think for yourself. That's right. I, uh, no, no, sir, I can't do that. We uh, need to know my orders. Right. Well, your orders were to march forward and, and take New Orleans, so keep marching forward. Don't tell me they kept marching forward. A great example of this. No, it's even worse than that, Johnny. The 93rd Highlanders were ordered to take an advanced red bout, uh, which is like basically a small little defensive position okay. that was right along the, the, the Mississippi River. They were ordered to take that position. They do take that position. And then all their officers are killed. And they're standing there and they don't know what to do. They don't have any orders to retreat. They don't have any orders to move forward. So they just stand there. They're like and robots. They get, and they get mowed down by the artillery and the American 7th Infantry Division that, takes, that retakes the position from them this is the problem with ai and computers like if you don't tell like a computer can be really smart but it's only as smart as what you tell it to do and if it's not able to think for itself it's going to have problems like that's these people just like they just malfunctioned shut down 
and like they were in like a rebooting sequence where <laughs> I don't know what to do, so I'll just I'm wait just gonna here. Stand here and get gunned down. We're just frozen. General- oh, they're shooting at us now. Don't know what to do about that. Oh well. <laughs> General Peckenham, seeing that things had gone a little sideways, decides in glorious fashion, I'm going to mount my horse and uh you know and lead my men to gloria and you know we're gonna we're gonna turn the tides and i'm gonna you know we're gonna we're gonna sweep them aside it's fine i just need to be glorious enough you know i need to be honorous enough and when he mounts his horse he gets hit in the shoulder i mean this is like i guess i guess movies didn't exist back then uh but this seems like he was inspired by By some bs movie but like when looking around your around at what's going on, at what point do you see that and you're like, oh, you know what? I got an idea. Things are gonna go well, and I'm gonna get up on a horse, and it's gonna change everything. <laughs> it is gonna change everything. Like he that. That is some arrogance. He gets shot. It gets even better, Johnny, because he gets shot off his horse. Right. He gets onto yeah. a new horse and then instantly gets hit in the belly with a grape shot round, and uh, well. That's, that's that's about the end for him so the shoulder i would did it i i obviously didn't like blow it off or anything it did, probably, it did, yeah I mean, it, it was probably more of an him. impact like a jousting type hit him in the shoulder knock him off the horse and and then he gets back up on a horse yeah, and, and then, then he tries another one and then gets one to the gut yep was that it for him so he's done he's done so yeah uh his second command major general samuel samuel gibbs is also hit by that grape shot round and same one I, I, I think it's the, the same one or from the same fire, but yeah. I, I want to say it's the same. I want to say they die at the same time, but they might, they might not, but it's either way. It's great. Well, and a lot of it's coming. So who could really tell? Right. Uh, so that sucks. A third <laughs> assault, which is going on at this exact same time that Packenham is trying to get up on his horse and lead his men to glorious battle, which is being led by major uh, Wilkinson of the 21st regiment of foot actually makes it to the earthworks. Wilkinson himself makes it across the moat, gets on top of the earthworks and instantly is shot. Because he, he got, did he get there like by himself? Pretty much. Yeah. So he's just and like, the oh, king are, of the hill. And yeah, pretty much. <laughs> And the Americans are so, like, enamored by his bravery, they actually pull him off the earthworks and bring him back behind the lines. Before they shoot him? No, he's shot. He's already shot. Oh. But they bring him back behind the lines where he, you know, he's going to, uh, well. You know. How nice. You know, there's not a lot of surviving when you get hit. <laughs> I, mean, like, I, mean, I guess we'll. Uh, uh, this, this is our 1795 Springfield musket. It shoots a 69 caliber round ball. Or you can shoot a 69 round uh, caliber round ball with three, what are called buck shots that are 30 caliber balls in front of it. So you get four shots out of one gun. All right. Dumb it down for me just real quick. Um, 30 caliber related to like a nine millimeter or whatever. So, like... so, so 30 caliber is a little smaller than a nine millimeter pistol, but 69 caliber is like two nine millimeters. Size okay. Gotcha. It's okay. over half an inch. Is how big that ball is. Yikes! It's a big ball. Yeah. Um, and I bring this up because the British are marching in such dense formations, packed together so tightly that although this is smooth board and doesn't have much accuracy, you don't even need to aim it. In fact, yeah. a lot of the soldiers were just sticking the guns up on the breastwork and blind firing because <laughs> you're going to hit that's something. All they needed to do. They yeah. you can't you cannot miss. Yeah, it's like like they literally just brought a gigantic broadside of the barn. Like <laughs> they're marching shoulder to shoulder through that. Uh, was that because yep. of terrain, or just that's what the military? That's the that's, did. The, that's the, the style of uh, the yeah. Napoleonic warfare. That's how that's how you fought. Yeah, you, it, it is. So with that, and I, you know, the, guns the civil war like that. That's why the right, civil war right, right. But like, is, is the idea I would assume is that you are. It's intimidation. It's I have these ranks marching in line, and then rank, 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 and you're trying to. It, it's it's you well, know part of it. Part of it is intimidation. Part of it is again going back to smooth bores. You don't have the accuracy of a rifle, so right. when you march in those dense formations, you give yourself that much more of a percentage of hit when you fire in volleys. Just because all of them are coming from a closer area yep. into yep. a so string. Okay. The, I know, mean, but volume the, by number. Right. But the other side of it is you're providing a huge target. A <laughs> more consistent it's, target. It is honor, Johnny. It is oh, honor. Oh, that's right. 
That's right. People people thought there was honor in dying for some weird ideal or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> right. Like freedom or something. I don't know. Now, General Packingham, uh, uh, on his dying orders, says to one of his aides, tell General Lambert, who's a third in command, who's now up, uh, to continue the advance at all costs. Continue it at all costs. Despite the fact that my men have been butchered, I'm dead, second in command's dead, all the officers are dead. Tell that reser- the guy who's in command of the reserves, tell him to keep marching forward. Was that guy like, sir, do you realize it's going to literally cost everything? <laughs> at all costs means we all die. Yeah. <laughs> like, what- <laughs> Upon hearing this order, General Lambert essentially says, yeah, I'm in command now and I'll do what I want. Good man. At which point he surveys the field, says, I'm going to put my reserves just far enough in to cover the retreat and orders a general retreat. I like this guy. Which is a good move and really was probably the best move. Although, to be fair, what he doesn't know is that those 780 troops on the Mississippi that went on the West Banks actually have now made it to those artillery positions and have now taken the American artillery positions. I mean, that's great and all, but that's not on him. No, it's not. But had they get had enough time, they could have turned those guns onto the American positions, or alternatively, could have just literally walked onto New Orleans and taken New Orleans, which was their Man, goal, anyways. That would have been so crazy because, like, if the British were able to take that, we'd probably all be speaking English right now, right? <laughs> it would be crazy. We would be speaking English. <laughs> to hell with that. Uh, but the bugle went, rang. Those guys in the Mississippi, they're like, ah, well, <laughs> orders are orders. Again, this goes back to the robot. Yeah. Had they had any degree of common sense, would have been like, now nah, we're good. Yeah, no thanks. No one's is right there. We're going to go there. But in any case, they retreat with everybody else. <laughs> now, this is the fun part, Johnny. I've just been speaking for, what, about 30 minutes, give or take? 25 minutes? Hmm. That's how long the battle was, Johnny. From the first shot to the retreat, 25 minutes. Wait, wait. Okay, whoa. So... Okay, so they didn't wait at all for people to get up and take over the flank. Like, I figured this would be like a 8, 10, 12 hour ordeal with all that shit that's going on. But, like, they just, they're just like, we are in a tight schedule and we must make these decisions very, very quickly. 25 minutes. This episode will last longer than the battle. It already has. 25 minutes. Holy shit. The aftermath, Johnny, we're already up to the aftermath, our casualty report. Uh, British forces, according to the British Adjutant General Robert Butler's, there are discrepancies, but I'm going by the official Robert Butler's report. 285 British killed, 1,265 wounded, 484 prisoners, and this is what's hilarious, those 484 prisoners, they pretended to be dead. And then after the retreat was ordered and the gunfire stopped, they stood up and said, we we surrender. (laughs) So they're just laying down in the swamp pretending they're already dead. Oh, that would be me. Oh, these guys are the smart ones. I'm such a coward. No, they're the smart ones. That's what I would have done. (laughs) Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't say I'm an idiot. I said I'm a coward. You can be smart and a coward. (laughs) On the flip side, Johnny, Americans, 13 killed. 30 wounded and 19 MIA. And those guys just, those were the pirates that went to New yeah. to see some boobies. Uh, and we called this a draw? No, we didn't know that the war was a draw. This battle was an uh, overwhelming victory. Okay. It, it is one of the only, it is probably the most substantial victory that we had during the war. Uh, it's pretty significant. Which happened after the war was over. Well, you know, logistics. It also goes down as one of the most lopsided battles in history. With yeah. one of the highest casualty counts per minute of battle. I mean, I was gonna, I was gonna say when you when you mentioned the British numbers, um, like those numbers were similar to a lot of the other Civil War battles that we've covered or talked about or whatever. Or quite and, low in comparison to some Civil War battles. Well, yeah, right, but, but those Civil War battles last like a day long yeah and it, a day <laughs> like this is 25 minutes to have a thousand people injured and 300 whatever dead like that's yeah, 285 quick. killed 1265 wounded 484 prisoners so their total casualty was 2000 a little over 2000 out of 8000 total troops holy cow. wolf 
25, like, 25. Hey, that's 1% of your troops a minute. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, universal blame for this battle on the British side would go to uh, to Colonel Mullins for forgetting the damn ladders. Oh, and by the way, Whoops. Mullins wasn't actually on the field himself. He was a mile behind the front line doing what officer gentlemen do, I guess, which is I will lead from behind. Yeah, that, that's a true leader right there. British forces would attempt to sail up the Mississippi on the 9th, but were cut down by U.S. Fort St. Philip, So, which was dumb of them because you knew the Mississippi was a no-go, so why did you right. try that anyways? I, I, I love the guys that are probably sitting at Fort Philip watching them try to work their way up the Mississippi, thinking, like, really? Are they for real? They're going to try that? All right, I guess right. so. We'll just yeah. start blasting them. By the 19th, General Lambert uh, thought that the Louisiana-Pennsylvania campaign was too costly to continue and withdrew his troops from Louisiana. Uh, the British forces uh, withdrew and attempted to take Fort Byer, or Bower, sorry, in Mobile Bay, Alabama, and were actually able to capture that on February 12, 1815, where they finally heard about the Treaty of Ghent <laughs> and said, oh, Oops. Jackson, however, was planning <laughs> Did a they give it back? <laughs> well, yeah, they did give it back. Jackson was planning a full scale attack where he was going to push the British out of Mobile and then had in intentions on pushing them into Spanish controlled Florida, which is actually an ally of the British at this time and oh, was also was... War with us during the War of 1812. And then he was told promptly by the U.S. Congress and the El Presidente, yeah, you know, peace. We've signed peace. Stop it. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of like his uh, method of it. He's like, oh, I totally, totally would have uh, bagged all those guys up, shoved them down into Florida, and been rid of them, if only you'd let me. Right. But there's a lot the of that happenstance. That like, oh, I guess it didn't really work out that way. So, but that's what I would have done. So go ahead and take that to the bank. We have a lot of generals that do that throughout <laughs> throughout history. <laughs> that's how they got to be generals. <laughs> right the british forces would pull out of the mediterranean altogether or pull out of of the caribbean and go back to the mediterranean altogether uh and you know you know we've made peace and we've never really fought with the british since we've been friendly-ish sort of are you mean i can't tell if because I, I don't know enough history to know if you're being sarcastic. i mean we, yeah i can't think a, of another war we've been in against them no but... we, we've not been in war with them again although we have come close including the pig war oh right <laughs> yeah it yep. came close to in the 1850s uh but no for the most part you know they acknowledge they, that we're a sovereign nation they yeah. acknowledge that they probably shouldn't take our people off of boats they look similar them enough fight to for us. the british crown yeah they, they look and similar we said, enough to us to not care about them we said we won't invade your country I mean, why would we want to? We would god nobody wants to invade england even had nine months of rain pal right now, Johnny, at this point, you might be wondering, what happened to that judge in Nolens, right? Because he's still sitting in jail, right? Well, I, I figured they executed him, actually. <laughs> no, he just threw him in jail cell. <laughs> so after the victory, Jackson would go over and release the, uh, would re release the, uh, the, the judge from jail, who then promptly issued a warrant for Jackson's arrest. Jackson would show up to his trial date, but he would show up in tow with a crap ton of pirates that yeah. he'd befriended during this battle. Yeah, that's how you who, do it. During the, during the whole trial, would just make asses of themselves and be ruckus, pirates be pirates so the judge couldn't get a word in and just decided to hell with it i'll fine you one thousand dollars and find jackson one thousand dollars which is equivalent to sixteen thousand seven hundred and forty dollars today pretty hefty fine so pretty hefty fine um that's the battle of all and i really should say it's the battle for new orleans because it really didn't happen at new orleans it was it was just outside of new orleans but anyways it's the battle for new orleans so Mardi Gras we have today, I guess, all because of this. <laughs> I'm sure that's the reason. This and this is why we celebrate Mardi Gras, boys and girls. And this is why we celebrate Mardi Gras. <laughs> all right, that's it for this week's episode of Historic Hindsight. Please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review, and join us next week when we talk about World War II pets. <laughs> <laughs>